Hey there, sports fans. This is the first video in what is likely to be the main meat of this channel, the real main focus. This is a series focusing on broad or more often specific research topics being worked on by various researchers. However, for now, we don't really have any real researchers to talk to, so you're kind of stuck with me talking about something I have experience with from undergrad. As I'm sure you're all tired of hearing, the Earth has a CO2 problem. And you probably shouldn't be tired of hearing that, that because it is a problem. If we continue business as usual, we are expected to reach an atmospheric CO2 concentration of about 800 parts per million by the end of the century, which is nearly 100% up from before the Industrial Revolution. And changes to the global climate are pretty much well underway. However, climate change isn't the only problem related to CO2. This graph you've been staring at for a while, while I rambled, is famously known as the Keeling Curve. It's a constantly updated figure showing the dissolved CO2 levels of the water around Mauna Loa, Hawaii from a research station. However, this particular graph shows something else. Ocean acidification, also called the other CO2 problem, is the result of increased CO2 dissolving into our oceans, which results in a lower pH. Not only is the CO2 in our atmosphere increasing, but it's also dissolving into our oceans, which has its own suite of problems. So these maps show the changes in pH around the globe based on data collected by two groups in the 90s. This data is compared to models that show what our oceans would look like in both 2050 and 2095 if we continue business as usual as we are now. As you can see in the more subpolar regions, these are the areas that are below or above the southern and northern extents of the planet, the water will likely have a lower pH because this water can hold more CO2 and is more, generally more productive. However, I'm getting a bit ahead of myself here. Let me give a basic overview of the process for all that. And for all that, I'll need some woo chemistry. Yeah, woo. Huh. Now, once the CO2 is dissolved, it reacts with the water to form carbonic acid. Carbonic acid then dissociates into bicarbonate and a hydrogen ion. Bicarbonate then becomes carbonate and loses another hydrogen ion. Now, this is, a, this is important for two reasons. Firstly, pH is based on the concentration of hydrogen ions in a solution. The more hydrogen ions you have in a solution compared to the, the actual amount of, in this case, water you have, then the lower the pH is going to be. The other issue is what happens to the carbonate. This substance reacts readily with calcium in the water to form calcium carbonate. Now the problem is calcium is normally used by shellfish to create their shells. I guess this brings a new meaning to clams on the half shell. <laughs> uh. now, to an extent, this is all natural. Carbonate ex exists normally in the seawater and generally isn't a problem However, as the amount of CO2 entering the water increases, the level of carbonate will also increase, and the compounding loss of calcium can become problematic. There are also other ways for the CO2 concentration to change, particularly in coastal ecosystems where the ecosystem is more active. Natural fluctuations over the course of days, months, and even over the course of seasons are pretty common, and the issue we are facing now is one of consistent change, changes to the global average that can have issues over time. The, uh, longer that the pH stays as low as it does, the more time it has to affect the organisms in that environment. Studies have also found that eutrophication has an impact. So basically eutrophication is the process by which a body of water becomes unhealthy. Generally you'll, talk, you'll hear it used to describe lakes and other more inland bodies of water, but it can also be used to talk about coastal ecosystems such as bays, and estuaries. The main thing to be considered here are algal blooms, and these are large growths of algae that occur during, usually during the summer because there's more nutrients flowing into the water from the surrounding houses and farms and other things like that. And this algae is consumed by microbes in the water. And if you remember your basic biology, when an organism like a microbe eats something, it needs to take in oxygen for respiration and then it pumps out CO2 when it's done. That's the basic uh, outcome of respiration. So now this is going to put more CO2 into the water, which in turn is going to cause ocean acidification. 
These maps come from a study done by a group at Stony Brook on Long Island, and they show an area of Long Island coastline uh, over the course of many months. And they're looking at DO, which is dissolved oxygen, pH, which you've already talked about, and chlorophyll A. Chlorophyll A is used as a measure of the plant matter. Chlorophyll is used by plants and algae for photosynthesis, so it's a good way to determine the concentration of plants there. Now you can see during the summer months, the level of chlorophyll increases, that's shown by the more red color, and that's likely algal blooms or just generally more algal growth. And the pH and the DO begin to decrease because the oxygen is being used and the CO2 is being put into the water. All right, now for the important bit, the moment you've all been waiting for, the really fun part. Should I give a drum roll? That's right, how does it affect shellfish? Since the early 2000s, when ocean acidification research first started to become popular, there's been a decent number of studies looking at how the phenomenon impacts the development of shellfish, such as scallops and clams. As I mentioned before, ocean acidification disrupts the chemical process that shellfish larvae use to calcify their shells. Therefore, most studies focus on how exposure to acidic water affects the growth rate and survival of these shellfish. Generally, it's been found that when larvae are exposed to CO2-infused water, their general growth is inhibited, decreasing the size of the adults as they grow up. Also, their ability to calcify their shells is inhibited, preventing metamorphosis into adults, and oftentimes they are even killed. Uh, now to move on to fish, where the research is a bit more varied, a bit more exciting, I think. So aside from the obvious impacts, there's been research to show that larval fish exposed to acidified water experience reduced swimming ability. This means that they won't swim as far and they have impaired navigational abilities, likely due to decreased oxygen absorption. Also, there's been research done that, um, uh, oof. Anyway, let's move on. So when it comes to fish, it's mainly the eggs and larval stages that are affected. These are collectively known as the early life stages when you're in the biz like I am. <laughs> so it's been found that these larval fish, when they're exposed to acidified water as larvae, generally will have impaired neural development, mainly relating to their sense of smell and their sense of hearing. So because of this, there's been a large body of research examining how this affects the behavior of adults utilizing choice experiments. So these studies utilize this fancy machine right here called a choice tank. Basically, it's a fish tank fed by two pumps that allows it for the creation of two distinct streams of water, as you can see here. This means you can give the fish a choice between two conditions and track their movements to learn their preferences. And now you too can own one of these babies for just $6,226. What a steal. So utilizing this high-tech machinery, researchers have found the fish exposed to acidified water will show more bold behavior, venturing from shelter and even moving towards the scent of predators. A bunch of idiots. So research looking at adult fish is a bit less common because adults are generally a bit more hardy compared to larval fish. They're able to withstand the pressure of CO2 more than the early life stages. However, there is some evidence showing general physical detriments related to exposure, such as impacts to blood flow and oxygen uptake. Now you guys may be sitting there saying, hey Danny, why the heck should I care about these animals? How does it affect me? As usual, the answer can be found on the web the food web. The fish I've talked about are generally forage fish. These are small species that may not seem important to you, but are to the ecosystem at large. They serve as a food source for the species that we generally do care about for economic or personal reasons. And as far as shellfish go, well, I think that's a bit more obvious. Well guys, that's it. I hope you enjoyed the first video in this series and are looking forward to the next one. We welcome any civil discussion in the comments, as well as corrections if I got anything wrong, though please provide a source if you do. And with that, see you next time!